Hello TCG and Locana enthusiasts and welcome to another deck profile where today we are looking at the best deck of set 2 and set 1, Amethyst Ruby Control. This deck got a whole lot new cards from Rise of the Floodborne. Now of course, this deck is very much viable in this format. It is played in a whole bunch of different variants this, from little changes, but this is probably one of the major cores you can use, and then you can just swap out little cards here and there to what you like. So let's go through the card by card. We got two Olaf for many. These are, of course, our starters here being our 1-1s. One of course, our 1-3 bodies as well, so they're a little harder to take down. We got four of the Madam Him Snake, two Pinocchio. Whenever you play this character, you may exert chosen posing character. This is only here to start dealing with those characters we want our opponent to be dealt with. So in essence, it's like bring this out and then we can go Madam Him Fox to bounce it back to then swing over that target we just uh, have on the field that we just exerted or even using later on the Maui just... For instance, if our opponent plays a guy for their turn that's still drying, we can exert it to knock it out so our opponent can't use it next turn. Just some control aspect. Again, this is a control deck. Four of the Madam Him Fox with Rush. Four Maleficent because we are playing Amethyst. Maleficent is just a very good card. Drawing cards are very important. Two of the Crab. Uh, Merlin Crab. When I actually did my color reviews i said this card probably wasn't going to see a lot of play it was like niche i think the one that's the worst of them all is a squirrel but i thought the crab would be kind of niche it is appearing a lot throughout amethyst ruby control decks uh, when you play this character and when this character leaves play one of your characters just gains challenger three really good on uh, well your madam him body your maui body so in essence just being able to buff up those bodies is really really nice especially to knock out big powerful um bootied will characters we have four of the evasive mini mouse four of the merlin goat four of the merlin rabbit again gains us lore and just draws us cards one of the peter pan shadow a lot of decks aren't playing this but we are playing this because all our characters with rush gain evasive so madam him fox gains evasive as well as maui and why that is important is the fact is since these guys come in and with Maui, he will he use Reckless, so he has to swing into something. But both of these characters are receptible to coming in and then melee being exerted, the turn we bring them in. Because they're always going to rush in at something. That's what their purpose is. They're supposed to come down, rush in, knock something out. But if we want to protect them so our opponent doesn't, you know, knock them out with some of the, one of their characters that's kind of pointless for them to have or something they just want to get rid of, well... Now we can keep them in an evasive state. So I mean, the only thing that can actually target them in a challenge is evasive characters. Now I'm mentioning this gives us the ability to give them evasive so they can challenge evasive characters. So we can deal with those evasive style decks that just play a bunch of evasive dudes and we really don't have a way to counteract that except like be prepared. So it's very good for the defensive side to protect them so they constantly are just a nuisance to our opponent. And then also be that nuisance to evasive opponents who think that they are completely safe, that their evasive guys won't get knocked out. And with as many evasive guys that have high lore at such small bodies like Minnie Mouse, now this just makes it so that they are 100% threatened. So that is very, very good, very controlly, and I really like this Peter Pan Shadow. Now, not a lot of decks are playing this, but I really wanted to play it because we do have a few people that are good at rushing. Anyways, we have the two Yzma. Um, we're just not we're not playing the Yzma for it. The little Yzma to shift over it, or any little Yzma to shift over it. But when you play this character, shuffle another chosen character into the player's deck, and then draw two cards. Whether it's our opponent, we probably want to do it more on ours. But if we have to get rid of a something from our opponent's side of the field and give them two cards, that's okay, because it does remove a threat that could possibly harm us. We have four of the Lady Tremaine. We're not playing any of the smaller, the little Lady Tremaine from Ruby um, to, of course, shift over this. Uh, when you play this character, each opponent chooses and banishes one of their characters. So in essence, if our opponent only has one character, we play it out. Our opponent has to banish that one character and remove it. So nonetheless, it's just a nice control aspect of your opponent has to choose something to banish. And finally, we have the two Maleficent to, of course, do the clearing board wipe or clear a guy onto the board. Again, be cautious, Ward does still exist in the Sapphire engine. 
So you won't be able to choose many characters. All right. So anyways, now to our songs, we have three teeth and ambitions. You deal two damage to one of your own characters and then deal two damage to one to another chosen character. So in essence, it's really good to kind of combo with the Yzma because you could go sing this song on anyone that has two cost or more and then deal damage, two damage to one of your characters and then have that character be cycled back with Yzma. For instance, you want to protect your Maui. All right, well, then we could cycle Maui back into our deck to have it. But it also is great to go on top of our Merlin Crab on our Merlin Goat, on our Merlin Rabbit, because these guys have effects when they leave the field. So if we have swing our Merlin Rabbit in, knock something out, it only has one damage left, then what we could do is Teeth and Ambitions it, deal the last two damage to the Merlin Rabbit, knocking it out, or the Goat knocking it out, and then put two damage on something of our opponent's side of the board, maybe knocking something out, or just dealing extra damage so that say we can throw a Maui down or throw something down to deal that extra little damage like Madam Him um, the Fox. It just allows us to cycle ability of this card to give us that extra draw. Or maybe we just need that one lore. We had the Merlin Goat up. We just need to find a way to knock it out to get that one last lore to win the game. Teeth and ambitions. We knock it out. We gain that lore. So really nice. Again, another good part about it is you could do it on an Yzma play as well. Do Teeth and Ambition to knock something on, out on your opponent's side of the board. You want to keep that card, um, but you don't want it to be damaged on the field. Ease my, ease my, back into your deck, draw two cards. So it's pretty nice. Uh, friends on the other side, it's Pot Agree, draw two cards. We sing this off of Maleficent. That's the combo. Maleficent, draw one card, then sing Friends on the other side to draw two cards. Be prepared. It's the best board wipe around. Uh, you can sing it on a seven-cost body. We're not going to be singing this, as you can see. The only card that can actually sing it is Maleficent. So typically, we'll just be hard casting this. And then finally, we have the two spell book because we are a control deck. This is a win more card. So if we are basically need like a lore left, we bring this down first three costs. It dries. Then we pay the one and we win the game. In essence, you just keep this in your hand until that time period where you need to win. You throw it down, you tap it, you win. In essence, we can also throw it down early game. So we are always threatening it. But with Binja being in the format, now, especially for any steel decks, we want to keep this in our um, hand until the last possible minute so that we can slap it down and win the game. So that is the deck. Uh, like I said, the core here is very, very strong. The cards that you can easily take out is you could buff up your Olaf's to three, take out a mini, take out the Pinocchio. Maybe you want to put in um, Ursula's. I've seen decks play Ursula. Maybe you don't even want to play Peter Pan Shadow, so you remove that card to play something else. Really, Ruby Amethyst Control is how you feel the deck should run. The core of the deck, minus Peter Pan Shadow and Pinocchio, and maybe one more, and adding up one more Olaf and knocking out one more mini. That was excited the cards that you can just kind of play around with. And like I said, I've seen decks playing Ursula. I've seen decks playing more Olaf. I've seen decks not playing this Pinocchio at all. You could probably, even if you wanted to, put in the two drop three questing Pinocchio and then bounce it back with like either Madam Ham, you probably want to do the Fox so you could run in with his rushing ability. But you could do that as well. But what we have here is the strong core of what Ruby Amethyst Control is. But let me know down in the comments your thoughts of the current version of Ruby Amethyst Control. Do you think this deck is going to move forward to be the top deck in the set three meta? What are your thoughts overall on Ruby Amethyst Control being the best deck from chapter one? To the best deck of set to Rise of the Floodborne. Let me know all of that down in the comments and what cards you play in your Ruby Amethyst Control deck and everything else under the sun about Amethyst Ruby Control or the state of Lorcana post release of Rise of the Floodborne. And while you're commenting, do make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell so you can notify when my videos go live for you. And we'll see you here next time on Mama Dragons TCG.